Hey guys, what's up? It's Snake here, and uh, it looks like we're playing some Ascension. Uh, let's see, what should we talk about today? Some more quantum physics. How about that? Um, first, actually, I'd just like to start out uh, by saying I got a lot of comments in my last video, and I'm going to link all of my science-y uh, zombie videos together so you can watch it, but I talked about the end of our zombie saga. Um, because they're calling Moon the Climax to the zombie saga. And a lot of people wanted to point out to me that Climax doesn't mean that it's the end of the story. And you're absolutely right, there is a denouement and a resolution. Um, but this isn't a 18th century romantic novel. We're not deconstructing Dracula or Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or anything like that. Uh, we're playing a video game, you know? And, uh what happens in the climax of any story whether it's a video game or a movie or a, or a book or whatever uh, the climax is where the protagonist overcomes the antagonist whether the antagonist is himself or uh, forces of nature or another person or a, a chain of events or where it doesn't matter whatever the antagonist is the climax is where the protagonist is able to overcome him uh, or it uh, and then afterwards, the denouement, the resolution, is used to sort of wrap everything up into a nice little bow. Um, but like I said, we're dealing with a video game, and the climax is where we defeat, who knows, whether it's Richtofen or the Horde of Zombies or Sam or whoever the main bad guy ends up actually being. Um, so then if, if that climax then is Moon, and that's where we defeat the main bad guy, uh, then what, what, like, I guess what my question is, is um, what would the next map entail? The resolution and denouement map of our saga, what would it really entail? I mean, in essence, if we've defeated the bad guy and there's no more zombies, uh, for our saga at least, the next map would just be us walking around picking up zombie bits and putting them in the trash. And, uh, I don't know, leaving them out for the recycling the next day or something like that. You know, there, there wouldn't really be anything for us to do in a map um, for the denouement resolution. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I mean, if there was going to be a denouement resolution to our story, which I'm sure there will be, uh, it would probably be more in the form of uh, Treyarch coming out with a cutscene, um, possibly a lengthy cutscene to sort of give us um, an ending to the story. Uh, you know, sort of a, a little video or something that showed exactly what happened after we destroyed whoever it, who, you know, whoever the final boss may be, whether it's Sam or Rick Toffin or whoever, the Cosmic Silverback, uh, Maxis, it doesn't matter who it is. Um, the climax would be that, and then the resolution would be what happens afterwards. There wouldn't be any fighting for us to do after the climax, because the climax, uh, just like in any other story, is the end of the fighting. Um, so, uh, however, if there is some sort of cutscene that Treyarch will do, which I, I hope there will be to, to sort of give us, a, uh, to give us a finite ending to our saga, um, chances are we would see that cutscene not right after we get Moon. It wouldn't be after we receive the new map pack, uh, because the PS3 and PC users wouldn't have that map pack yet. Uh, so we would have to wait until the PS3 and PC users are able to play the match at least for a little bit, uh, you know, because what would be the point in giving us the answer, the, the end of the story, until after everybody's had a chance to play it. Uh, so my guess is whenever the PC, PS3 and PC users get it, uh, a couple weeks later is when we would finally receive that, that cutscene uh, that would act as a resolution or a denouement resolution to our story. Uh, however, I don't see, it wouldn't make any sense for us to have a, a map that was the resolution, a map that, that existed after the climax, after we defeated the zombies, because once we defeat them, there's no more zombies to fight. Uh, and again, that doesn't mean that, that it's the end of zombies completely, it just means it's the end of our storyline. And who knows, maybe Sam will be the main bad guy in the next storyline as well, um, or maybe Richtofen will defeat Sam and become the next bad guy in whatever the next storyline is. Actually, I even got a comment, and I forget who left me the comment, but they were saying, what if the next storyline we play is the storyline from Dead Ops, and Co the Cosmic Silverback is the main bad guy in that one. 
Uh, so who knows? That would actually be really interesting because, as we know, the four characters from Dead Ops are not our four characters. They're somebody different, uh, and they go through a whole different storyline. And you actually see all the all the different areas that they go to in Dead Ops could it possibly be uh, different maps that we play through in that storyline. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, we're just going to have to wait and see for that. But I really do think that the climax means the last part of our storyline, the last part that we're going to deal with. And whether or not some of our characters bleed over into new storylines, who knows exactly. But it just wouldn't make any sense for there to be a resolution slash den uh, denouement slash resolution map because without the antagonist, uh, there would be no fighting. There would be nothing for us to do. Uh, so anyway, uh, on to quantum mechanics, uh, quantum entanglement uh, theory, actually. Uh, first off, I just want to point out that, that QED does not stand for quantum entanglement device. QED actually stands for quantum electrodynamics, uh, which is a, a completely different corner of quantum physics. Uh, anyway, that's besides the point. So let's talk about quantum entanglement theory. Okay, so the best way to understand quantum entanglement is uh, let's say I have a coin and I split that coin in half uh, so that one half says heads and the other half says tails and I wrap it up into paper and I hand you one and I keep one myself so now uh, these two particles or two pieces of the coin are entangled uh, and so it doesn't matter what mine is because uh, obviously since they're wrapped in paper we neither of us know which one is which um, it doesn't matter what mine is yours will always be the opposite so at the moment, mine is both heads and tails, if you recall my conversation on uh, Schrodinger's cat. Um, because it has a possibility of both being heads or tails, it is actually both at the same time, uh, both heads and tails. And as soon as I open up the paper, it chooses one, and it either becomes heads or tails. So let's say, for instance, mine, uh, as soon as I open up the paper, we discover that my half of the coin is heads. That means that, without a doubt, yours will definitely be tails, uh, because we already know what mine is. Um, but we could do that with anything. So let's say we had two particles that became entangled, and so we observed mine, and mine was spinning clockwise. Let's say the spinning would be the, the effect that it would have, and so mine spins clockwise. We know then, since yours is entangled with mine, your particle would automatically spin counterclockwise, whether we observed it or not. So at, at any point, once we observed yours, we would see that it had to be, um, it had begun spinning counterclockwise because mine had spun clockwise, and counterclockwise is obviously the opposite of clockwise. So what does that mean in our storyline? Well, it, it's an interesting thing to note because, for instance, Die Glock, if you recall when I talked about it in Doris, uh the bell, Die Glock, uh, was a, a device that actually had two cylinders inside that spun in opposite directions. So uh, the one cylinder would spin clockwise and the other counterclockwise. So there's sort of a, a, a similarity to the two cylinders possibly being uh, entangled somehow. Uh, which would generate the uh, the energy used for flight. Uh, because if you recall, Diglock was, uh, I mean, it, it could have possibly been many things. There's a lot of different conspiracy theories surrounding Diglock. But the main one, of course, was that uh, Diglock was an anti-gravity machine or some sort of flying saucer. And, of course, this is supported by many, uh, many different sightings across the world. Uh, even here in America, there's a, a place in Pennsylvania called Chikara, and uh, the Chikara meteor, which uh, was con which uh, conspiracy theorists believe to be some sort of flying saucer, and uh, eyewitness accounts describe it as an acorn of some sort. Uh, but the way they actually describe it uh, sounds very very similar to that of Diglock or the bell, uh, because if you hold an acorn upside down, it does look very similar to a bell, and the. Um, there's actually an, an artist rendition in paper mache that that uh, is supposed to look exactly like this flying machine or flying saucer that landed in Chikara, and it looks identical to what the bell looks like. You know, not just our teleporters in in the zombie uh, world, but as well as many other uh, artist renditions of Die Glock in um, in conspiracy theory culture. 
So, uh, what else could this mean, though? Uh, I mean, what other parts of the zombie storyline does this affect, this, uh, this um, uh, entanglement theory? Well, another, uh, another thing that we talk about in Ascension, if you recall from my Ascension storyline, is the Casimir effect. And that's Casimir with C, not with a K. Uh, although I'm sure the, the two Casimirs, the Casimir in, in our storyline and the Casimir in real life, um, are similar uh, sounding for a reason. Uh, and the way the Casimir effect works is two plates uh, that have zero charge or, or no electromagnetic energy. Uh, are placed next to each other in a vacuum, uh, very, very close to each other, like uh, a millimeter or so apart. And uh, what happens is, even though they have no charge themselves, they have a, a latent energy, um, because all things in the universe have some sort of latent energy. And, um, and so these, the energy from these two plates will have an effect on each other. And uh, what happens is they'll either... Um, they'll have an opposite effect, just like two entangled particles. So if, let's say, one of the plates pushes forward and the other plate pushes back, um, because these two plates are facing each other, they'll actually push away, uh, or they'll be pulled towards each other, or different things like that. Um, it's even theorized that through the Casimir effect, it could be used to uh, create faster-than-light transmission. Uh, and the way that sort of works, or the way the idea behind it would work is the two plates are placed next to each other. And so let's say one plate uh, has an effect where it pulls, uh, pulls to the left, and the other plate would pull to the right. But since they're facing each other, what's happening is they're both pulling in the same direction. Uh, so you could place a, a bit of information or, or some sort of light particle or something like that uh, between the two plates. And, and the pull that the Casimir effect has on the two plates would actually take the particle and pull it through the space of the two plates faster than, than the speed of light. Uh, again, this is all theoretical and it hasn't actually been proven to happen yet. Um, but of course, that's, again, it's, a getting, it's getting a little off subject. Okay, so let's now talk about quantum teleportation. Okay, so the way quantum teleportation works is, let's say we have two people. We have person A and person B. Now, person A has uh, two, two qubits of inter information. So it has uh, qubit 1 and qubit 2A. Uh, and then person B has qubit 2B. And the reason why it's 2A and 2B is because 2A and 2B are actually entangled. Uh, and they became entangled at some point before uh, before the experiment we're doing. So if uh, person A takes qubit 1 and qubit 2A and measures his information, he doesn't even have to know exactly what qubit 1 is. He just has to measure the two qubits that he has and then transmits that information to person B. Um, and through the process of measuring, uh, his qubits are destroyed. Uh, how this works, it's actually really, really complicated and unimportant to the, uh, to the experiment we're having. But uh, his, his information is, is thus destroyed, and the information is then transferred to person B, at which point person B can take his qubit of information, his qubit 2B, and pass it through what's called a gate. And by passing it through the gate, he can actually change his information 2B, his qubit 2B, into qubit 1. And so what appears is it almost seems like uh, cloning, um, but in fact it's not ex exactly cloning. It's a, you're not because um, because qubit one was destroyed uh, in the measurement of the original information and then reproduced by person B. Uh, it's not exactly cloning, but more like teleportation almost, uh, and not in the science fiction sense like Star Trek. It's not actually. You can't actually take a person and teleport them from point A to point B, but the information is just replicated uh, so that it appears to be teleportation. Um, okay, uh, an easier way to think about this uh, in scientific, or not scientific, but uh, science fiction terms is to recall the movie The Prestige with uh, Hugh Jackman and um, Christian Bale. And, uh, you know, they're magicians, and I won't get into the story so I don't, like, ruin anything necessarily, but 
uh, a device is created in the movie where a person can get into the de device and they're actually replicated uh, somewhere else um, in the distance. It doesn't, you know, where, however far away, someone is actually replicated in, uh, to the mainframe at a distance and the first person, the person that stepped into the device is then destroyed. Um, so a copy is then created. Um, after the first one be, uh, is destroyed. So it's not exactly teleportation and it's not exactly cloning. It's, it's uh, sort of this weird science fiction -y kind of thing. Uh, so what does that mean as far as the quantum entanglement device? Well, um, the quantum entanglement device, uh, let's, okay, let's think of it like this. We're going to do something else where we, we have two, we have three people now, person A, person B and person C. Now for the sake of uh, the zombie storyline we'll say person B is actually device B or the quantum entanglement device. Now person A has a qubit of information and device B has two qubits of information. One that's entangled with person A's qubit and one that's entangled with person C's qubit and obviously of course person C must also have a qubit of information. So between the three, um, between the three points, there's four bits of information. Now, if uh, the device, device B, uh, studies its information, measures it, and then transfers that information to person C, just like we did before with the quantum teleportation, uh, person uh, the person C now is able to pass his qubit of information through a gate and change it so that it mirrors the other bit of information that device B had. Uh, and I know it's a little bit complicated, but in essence what it means is uh, person C's information has now become the piece of information that device B had that was entangled with A. Uh, in essence, what that means now is person C's bit of information is now entangled with person A's information, uh, thus cutting out the middleman, uh, cutting out device B. So the device, in essence, uh, what it's doing is entangling person A and person C together, um, uh, or linking them in some way. What does that mean for the zombie storyline, or, or what does that mean as far as what the quantum entanglement device will do in the game? I'm not exactly sure, but uh, what it what it seems to mean to me, at least, is that it it's linking um, it's linking. We'll call them person A and person C together, and I'm using persons um, for lack of a better word because we don't really know what the entanglement device is going to be linking. Uh, whether it's one of our characters to another one of our characters or whether it's one of our characters to a zombie or whether it's using two spaces on the map uh, to link together um, we won't really know until we play the map uh, as far as, as, as what person A and person C really are. Um, another possible thing it could mean and this goes back to the Casimir mechanism and how I talked about in the storyline uh, how it was, how the point of the Casimir mechanism was to pull, pull two universes, two parallel universes together, uh, our universe and, and a separate universe, and create a gateway. Uh, so the quantum entanglement device could be a, a sort of like a, an advanced form of this. So the person A and person C could actually be two different dimensions or two different universes. Uh, and this, of course, could lend itself to. Um, uh, uh, the uh, the reason why the zombies are phasing in and out of sight or shifting in and out of sight because they're actually shifting in and out of reality uh, between two different dimensions. Uh, so anyway, that looks like it's going to be it for me. It's it's all pretty interesting stuff. It's uh, pretty exciting to to think you know how amazing this new map is going to be. And, uh, and yeah, that's going to be it for me. So I hope you like this. If you want, go ahead and leave comments below. Like, uh, you know, follow me on Facebook and Twitter, all that, all that junk. And, uh, and it looks like I finally crossed over the 300 sub mark. So it's pretty exciting for me. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty pumped about that. And I hope I can keep bringing you awesome videos like this. So, yeah, until next time, guys. Peace out.